This video might offend some of you. I've made plenty of videos celebrating how great Destiny 1 was and still is to this day, so I think it's only fair I make at least one critical video looking objectively without the nostalgia goggles at some of the things that weren't too great about this game. And leave a comment if you can think of any that I missed. Firstly, when you received a weapon, it wasn't actually complete or working how it should do. You had to level the weapon up in order to unlock and use any of its perks. Now in year one, there was zero way to speed this up. You literally had to take the weapon in and use it, get kills, complete activities and get XP in order to unlock the perks to be able to then know even if you like it or not. In Taken King, they made it so that motes of light could actually be used as consumables to get XP, but still made the process very tedious and a lot of people didn't have loads of motes of light. So it was actually expensive and time consuming to even know if you want to use a weapon. Imagine grinding or getting lucky, getting a brand new exotic. You're excited to use it, but you actually can't properly because none of its perks are even activated yet. In Destiny 1, there was no way to know when public events or even where they would occur. You had to actually use a separate website that we would basically have bookmarked and that had a countdown timer of all the events and it still wasn't even entirely accurate. But public events were almost like this secret thing that you would never know when or if they would happen. Obviously, if you're familiar with the game, you'd memorize certain spots and general timings, but they were randomized and on rotation. So public events were like this secret myth and you had to use an external website to know a gist, an idea of when they might happen. It wasn't even guaranteed. By far, one of Destiny's biggest criticisms was the lack of in-game lore. There was no way to actually find any backstory, any lore in the game. It really didn't help the narrative that Destiny had no story because you had to go again to an external website site Bungie.net and read these grimoire cards which is kind of tedious no one really wants to do it and definitely made the casual player way disconnected from the backstory something that's glaringly obvious if you go back and play now compared to destiny 2 is the lack of builds there is very little ability depth or things you can do besides just using your regular primary and secondary and heavy pretty much the most interesting thing about your entire character would be the exotic perk on your exotic armor it really shows how far Destiny 2 has excelled in this area, but the builds is by far one of my favorite elements of the game. Setting up builds and all these intricacies, there's almost too much. But if you go and play Destiny 1 PvE, you'll notice it does feel a little bit bland and all you're doing is really using your primary and secondary and heavy. There isn't that much exciting kind of ability fun you can have. A pretty significant amount of all Destiny 1 exotics are actually quite useless and gimmicky. They don't really serve much function and aren't very good compared to some of the outliers. Now, obviously, this is just a part of power creep. It's natural as games progress over many years. Things are going to get more powerful, more interesting. Developers learn how to design things that are more useful for general gameplay. But if you look at all the exotics, a large amount of these are very much useless or gimmicky. And by comparison, most of Destiny 2 exotics are pretty good. A lot of them are crazily strong. And since around Warmind and Forsaken, Bungie made a noticeable effort to make a lot of exotics just crazily broken and very noticeable. And again, in a game without any builds, a lot of these just did not find much use and were very much buried in the vault. So unfortunately, a lot of Destiny 1's exotics aren't actually that good. Now, the next one is kind of split. Some players loved it and some players hated it, but shaders only applied singly to your entire character. There was no individual customization of your gauntlets, your helmet. You had one shader, you put it on, and your entire guardian would look like that one shader. Now, on the upside, it made your character look a bit more consistent and shaders were well designed, so they did look good. But the downside is that, again, there's no customization and pretty much most guardians picked a few good shaders and we all ended up looking the same. So there wasn't that much uniqueness and the fashion endgame definitely is nowhere near what it is in Destiny 2. Definitely one of the most disliked features was this thing called a sprint cooldown penalty. So across the entire game, if you tried to sprint, there would then be this invisible countdown time of a few seconds where you couldn't sprint again. This is actually in the game by design, but it was too difficult for Bungie to simply patch it out. So what they did is in year three, Rise of Iron, they added eight artifacts with pretty cool and random abilities, but one of them, the memory of Yoldar, removed this cooldown completely. While it was a perfect fix for this, it was a shame to have to use your only artifact slot just to fix something that shouldn't really be in the game in the first place and wasn't at all in Destiny 2, they removed it. But basically the majority of players, especially in high skill Crucible, would always have memory of Yoldar on. You basically couldn't use any other artifacts. A pretty big one is there is no map for your current location. So when you were inside an actual patrol zone or a mission or wherever you are, you could not pull up a map and see where you are, what's going on around you, and obviously no public events. The only time you could see a map is if you're in orbit and about to load into a location, but maps were non-existent. So it wasn't a huge deal because it wasn't that much you needed a map for, but still, just for learning where you are and where you're going and the gist of what's in what direction, you had no idea where you actually were on the map. Probably one of the biggest on this entire list is the game is only in 30 FPS. Obviously, this game launched in 2014, even on old gen consoles, PlayStation 3 and 360. 
most shooters had higher frame rates. So Destiny was definitely an outlier. It's one of the few games still clinging on to 30. The game physically could not handle any higher FPS rates. So it was a much needed fix in Destiny 2, but definitely something that is very jarring. If you go back right now, you will notice it feels very slow and sluggish, but at the same time, it wasn't massively noticeable. You did just get used to it after playing the game for many, many, many hours. Next up, if you wanted to pick a new activity to load into, you had to go all the way back to orbit and actually pick the activity from the director screen. You could not pick an activity from any patrol space, any mission, any strike, and crucible, and even not the tower, which was really strange. Especially back in the day of consoles with very, very long loading screens, having to go to orbit just to know what you want to pick or just have a browse of the activities available definitely added a lot of wasted time to the game. Similarly, if you wanted to get some bounties, you had to go all the way to orbit, then all the way to the tower, and then run up to the bounty board and pick up your bounties. There was no companion app. Nowadays, you can get them all on your phone. But back in the day, a lot of you players will definitely recognize the pain of loading into an activity, realizing you forgot a bounty or a quest, going all the way back to orbit, all the way into the tower, and then all the way back to your activity. Now, Destiny 1's leveling system also wasn't that great. It did have a lot of arbitrary and kind of pointless features like the base leveling system. You had to level up through XP to, at the beginning, it was just level 20. And then beyond that, to get to level 30, you had to do end game activities and the raid it was the only way to be max level. But what was even weirder is that your weapons didn't have any effect on your level at all. They had this stat called attack, which still to this day, I don't even know what it did. Obviously, it just increases some kind of damage in PvE, but how much of an effect it had wasn't really explained or even that well known at all. And then, of course, your armor had defense stats, which was a whole different stat. Again, wasn't really explained much in game. But the attack and defense stats were completely separate to your base level and light level, which was the most important stat as far as dealing and receiving damage. This spawned the Forever 29 meme where it was very common to be missing just one piece of armor in order to get you to level 30 and without it you would always be stuck at 29 and there was no RNG protection so you'd be missing gauntlets basically for months at a time and in the raid the difference between being level 29 and 30 was massive so it was a huge pain. Definitely one of the worst things about Destiny 1 is that Cade is still alive. PlayStation exclusives were a massive pain point for Destiny. The entirety of Year 1, the Hawkmoon, one of the most famous, iconic, and actually one of the most powerful weapons in the whole game, was only available on PlayStation. That's a huge amount of the player base that could never even use this weapon, can never look at it, they can only see it through YouTube videos, and they could never actually get the Hawkmoon the entirety of Year 1. Bungie and Sony always had a very close relationship and this obviously was very unfortunate for Xbox players so the Hawkmoon was definitely a massive pain point but there was also the Monte Carlo from Vanilla, it wasn't massively strong but still something they couldn't get and then a Dark Below there was Fourth Horseman and Taken King there was Jade Rabbit, in the April update I think it was the Zen Meteor which was a very bad exotic but since the complaints about Hawkmoon Bungie gradually made a lot of the PlayStation exclusives not that great to avoid some of the backlash. Another thing that makes Destiny 1 PvE seem a lot more bland is the lack of class abilities. There were no barricades, no rifts, and no shade step at all. It was just your melee and your grenade, that was it. Now, shade step was actually added as a perk, a bonus feature, on the Night Stalker subclass, the brand new Void subclass that came in Taken King after an entire year of Destiny, and then eventually became so staple that Destiny 2 made it a base class ability. So compared to Destiny 2, it definitely makes the gameplay feel a lot more flat and you have less tools at your disposal. Self-res warlocks. These were by far one of the most controversial and disliked features. Obviously, if you're a warlock, you would have loved it. But for everyone else, they were very much hated. Imagine playing Trials. It's super competitive, a lot on the line. You're facing off against three warlocks. And then you know that at some point, all three of them could very much easily just come back to life. You're basically facing against six guardians instead of three. It added a whole new skill gap because you had to be prepared and you had to be aware of when those warlocks had their supers. And you had to basically guard the orbs to make sure when they come back, you've got the ammo and skill to even take them down because they're going to come back with super health and a ton of grenades. They're not just normal guardians. So they were a massive pain to deal with, especially in trials. But as a warlock, obviously it was very fun and nice to have. It's kind of back up in your pocket. that You can always come back to life and basically change the tide of an entire match. Another massively noticeable one, if you go back and play today, is that Destiny 1 has no mantle. So obviously the game never had mantle, so we kind of got used to it and everything was designed knowing that you couldn't mantle objects, but it still definitely caused a lot of problems, a lot of wipes and a lot of problems during jumping puzzles, but it definitely limited your mobility. And in Destiny 2, it is so nice knowing you can just jump into an object and climb over it and you kind of take it for granted. But going back into Destiny 1, you will definitely notice how you cannot mantle and it is very, very jarring. 
Next up, planetary materials were definitely a big pain point for Destiny. These were essential materials to upgrade basically anything. You couldn't actually purchase them at all in year one, so you had to go around. I still remember the days of running around and memorizing the spin metal farms and the relic iron. Mainly in year one, these were actually very scarce materials, but after Taken King, you could buy them from the Quartermaster. But before then, and even sometimes after still, if you couldn't afford to buy them, it was very normal to spend an hour or two just running around and farming those spin metals or spirit blooms. And it was also completely random which one of them your gear would require. So it would always end up being the one you have least of. But for the days of ghosts that could point them out for you, this was definitely a massive grind in Destiny, just the planetary materials. Some of the exotic quests in Destiny definitely traumatized a lot of players. One of the most noticeable ones would be the Thorn. Not only just getting it to drop in the first place was a massive RNG grind, but this Thorn quest had one of the most hated steps in the entirety of Destiny history. This required you to get 500 Guardian kills with void damage, but dying would actually take away from your progress. So you had to go very positive in order to even do this quest. And a lot of players who weren't too good at Crucible were incredibly frustrated and rightfully so. Another exotic quest, which a lot of you are probably thinking already, were the exotic swords. These were famous for being probably the worst. And the worst part was collecting 10 of these special planet sheet materials that were random and you had a tiny percentage, probably like 1 in 15 or 20, every time you pick up a plant tree material. So when you talk about plant tree farming, which was bad enough, imagine having to go and spend hours upon hours running around collecting these things, hoping for a random drop to get, and you had to get 10 of them. It was very painful. But you still weren't done there. You had to then get hundreds of ability kills, and certain classes, this was nearly impossible. If you're in a Void Titan, for example, the super was, of course, a bubble, and the melee was disintegrate. So you couldn't actually technically get Void kills. They didn't count. The only way you could get void ability kills was by your grenade. To be fair, they were very good swords, basically some of the best in the game, especially Raze Lighter, so it made up for it, but the exotic swords go down as possibly one of the worst and most grindy quests in Destiny history. The Crypt Arc in year one was famously savage for decrypting those engrams. There was actually a system where purple engrams could decrypt into blues, just random rare quality gear. This was back in the day where getting a purple was a huge, huge deal, like a massive upgrade, and to save up, maybe even hours of playtime just to get one purple and it goes into a blue was painful. But on top of that, often you could get engrams which would turn into ascendant materials, which probably you didn't need, or you get gear for entirely different classes. If you're only on a warlock, and this is again, back when most people didn't play multiple characters, you didn't even have a titan, you would get some titan gear that was completely useless. To make up for it, at least sometimes there was a very tiny chance, it never happened to me, but you could get blue engrams that decrypted into exotics, which was very rare and did happen a few times, but the Crypt Arc was quite a savage back in the day and instantly became one of the most famous and talked about characters in a video game. Something that's very unfortunate about Destiny 1 to this day that I still complain about is the special ammo system, especially in Crucible. Around Gear 2 and especially in Year 3, there are a lot of problems mainly with sidearms and specials being way too strong. The shotgun spam and sniper spam was kind of overrunning the Crucible, though to fix it, Bungie made it so you don't spawn with any special yet to go pick it up from crates, the same as heavy ammo. I really wish Destiny 1 could get the same system as Destiny 2 where you spawn with just a tiny bit of ammo, a little bit to get one or two kills and then you can go pick up more but spawning with zero ammo is quite annoying and it does make things like the icebreaker and sidearms even more powerful but obviously Destiny is not getting any more patches but I really wish they left it in a slightly better state where you could get at least some special ammo on spawn. For the first two years of Destiny 1 there were no private matches at all, there was zero way to just go into the Crucible map by yourself to test things out, to explore, to try and learn a map or just have fun with your friends. There was no private matches, and it was pretty much most of the time top of the list of things players were asking for, but wasn't a thing until year three in Rise of Iron. Something that was very talked about for the first couple years of Destiny was that you could not skip cutscenes ever, at all. You'd had to watch every single one, so if you were starting new characters, trying to grind and level up alts, you could not skip any cutscene, you had to sit through all of them. I believe it was in around year 3 when they finally added a skip cutscene feature, which was groundbreaking. I mean, basically every video game, it's a normal thing to skip cutscenes, but in Destiny 1, not a thing. Now, despite all these things, Destiny 1 was still way ahead of its time, and a lot of these things are only noticeable because they are now fixed in Destiny 2. So, hindsight is a powerful thing, but you should watch this video on screen if you want a more positive, nostalgic look at how well Destiny 1 still stands up today. If you wouldn't mind clicking the like button before you go, I would massively appreciate it. And also don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss out on my next video.